Today we are going to look at the genes equation. The idea is that we observe uh, large dark matter dominated structures and since the dark matter neither emits nor absorbs light we will have to use some of the uh, objects that we can see like uh, the galaxies moving around. So if we start with the cosmological simulation of structure formation then we know that um, there are large blobs of uh, dark matter sitting around and uh, these uh, dark matter structures they have the property as a function of radius that uh, the density is very high in the central region and as you go further out the density gets smaller and smaller and if you look at the uh, lower graph on this picture you see the slope the logarithmic derivative of the density and you see that in the inner region it is uh, quite shallow between uh, 0 and minus 1 and in the outer region it is maybe something like minus 3. This is going to be useful uh, later when we look at the actual structures. So in the last class we uh, considered uh, how to analyze uh, galaxy clusters by looking at uh, the tracer which could be the X-ray emitting gas. So this gas sometimes you have to be inventive when you look at a galaxy cluster and uh, you have to point your telescope in different directions on the sky so that you can observe the galaxy cluster at different uh, radii. This uh, was what we did last time and we used the hydrostatic equilibrium to do that. Now today we are going to again look at a galaxy cluster but we will be observing it in the visible light. So what we can see is the uh, the light coming from the stars. The stars are sitting in the galaxies and you see a lot of galaxies moving around. So here's a galaxy cluster, maybe a thousand galaxies moving around. And If we think of each of these galaxies as a particle, then we can actually look at how these particles are moving around amongst each other. Now here is a real observation. This is the Coma galaxy cluster. It is a very large region outside of the Coma galaxy cluster and each dot here is a galaxy and you see that in the very central region that's where Coma is there's a lot of galaxies and we're going to analyze the position and the motion of uh, those galaxies so if we zoom in this is uh, the Coma galaxy cluster the central region we see that there are many galaxies and uh, we can now separate them accordingly according to how far they are from the center. Uh, of course we can only see the position on the sky so we can only see the x and y coordinates of where the galaxies are. So each galaxy gives us the uh, projected radius. Now we have the projected radius and you see here I have colored uh, green or yellow depending upon how large projected radius there is. But on top of that we can also observe the uh, line of sight velocity. So we actually have more than these two dimensions information on the sky. We also have the line of sight velocity. And if you take a lot of these uh, galaxies that are nearby Coma and you plot them like this, you see that as a function of projected radius they have slightly different velocities and you see that uh, there's a velocity spread of something like a uh, thousand kilometers per second. So this picture is what we usually call the phase space. It is a combination of radius and velocity. You also see that uh, besides Coma there are lots of background galaxies. So there will be galaxies between us and Coma and there will be galaxies far behind coma. And because of the uh, expansion of the universe, uh, they will be flowing away at different velocities than the average coma velocity. For instance, in the top part of this graph to the right, you see there's a lot of uh, galaxies moving at more than 4,000 kilometers. Since the Hubble uh, rate is something like 70, that means that uh, these are actually uh, quite far away from us. So Coma cluster itself is actually about uh, 100 megaparsec away and that means that the central 
Velocity of coma is about 7,000 kilometers per second. On this figure, you can see that we have normalized uh, that velocity to zero. So uh, we are kind of sitting in the west frame of coma galaxy cluster. Now, we don't want to consider what is a large radii. So normally, we just consider what is inside the virial radius. And that we will also do now. So we will consider only the galaxies that really are in the equilibrated part of coma. If we consider that equilibrated part of coma, here is the projected radius, and again the uh, line of sight velocity. Now we can start looking at different radial bins. You see, there's, for instance, all the galaxies uh, that are colored uh, yellow, they are sitting at a certain projected radius from coma. And if we want to look at them, we see that most of them have velocities now normalized to around zero, um, and with a velocity spread of something like uh, maybe 1000. You also see in the very top part of this figure that there are a few outliers. So these are galaxies that are sitting behind coma and they're moving away. But since we just observe everything in front of us, this is a part of our observation. Now I want to consider only the yellow galaxies and I want to look at what is actually the distribution of the velocities. So in the next figure I look at only the yellow galaxies. Here are exactly the yellow galaxies and you see on the x-axis we now have the line of sight velocity and I have binned them. So you see that there are many galaxies that have velocities uh, around zero and you see that, uh, that there are few who have velocities uh, of the order 1000 kilometers per second. And you can fit this one, uh, for instance you can fit it with a Gaussian, and you see that it, it happens to have a spread which is around uh, 700 kilometers per second. You also still see that there are some outliers, there's for instance uh, outliers around uh, between three and 4,000, but also close to coma there are some galaxies that probably do not belong to the equilibrated part of coma. If you um, look at many radial bins, then you see for each radial bin, then you can look at the distribution of velocities. And typically you find that there's some noise, these are the foreground or background galaxies. And then uh, the galaxies that are inside this bin, uh, they can be fitted roughly with a Gaussian. It has this shape. And this shape we kind of know because, you know, for classical gas, if you just look at the velocity distribution of a gas, then it is something like the exponent of minus the energy over temperature. So it is really something that goes like uh, V squared, uh, normal house somehow. So this uh, gas we look at, um, it is in a box and the box is at rest. So that means that the, the V0 for gas is zero. Um, for the coma galaxy cluster of course the V0 is something like 7000 kilometers per second but we have normalized it away. And if you compare the um, expression for the galaxy motion and you compare it to the temperature in a gas, then you see that the velocity dispersion, that is the spread of the velocities of the galaxies, that the velocity dispersion, that is sigma squared, is something that looks like the temperature of a gas. So if you look at the sky, you are the observer to the left. You look at the galaxy cluster, you observe the, this uh, projected radius, and then you can really measure two things. You can measure the, uh, the density on the sky. So the closer to the center, the higher the density. And you can also, for each radial bin, you can measure this, uh, the spread of the velocities, that's the velocity dispersion of these galaxies. And what we just did now was we, we looked at the sky, that's the figure on the left, and we see that the density is higher density in the center and smaller density outwards. And for each radial bin, we get this velocity dispersion. We can fit, for instance, the noise plus a Gaussian, and we get this one. Um, so the point is that these galaxies, when we do the full analysis, we can realize that they actually only contribute uh, maybe 
of the total mass of the cluster. However, we want to know all the mass. So what we really would like to have is, um, is like some kind of equation that could combine uh, the density of the galaxies and the velocity dispersion of the galaxies with the total mass. And this is what we're setting out to do now. So last time we talked about the um, hydrostatic equilibrium. And that we cannot use now because the hydrostatic equilibrium is derived under the assumption that there are many, many, many collisions. And since galaxies virtually never collide, then uh, we cannot use any of these equations from the fluid dynamics. Instead, what we have to do is to use something called the collisionless Boltzmann equation. So collisionless means that the particles do not collide. Surprise. Um, it looks extremely simple, the equation. It says we have some quantity called f. It is a probability of finding a galaxy at a specific point in space and with a specific velocity. And what this collision, this Boltzmann equation says is that, um, that this uh, probability is a conserved quantity. So df dt is zero. Now, this looks absolutely beautiful, but um, there are two defects of this equation. And the first one is, it is actually an extremely complicated equation if you write it out. So it is virtually impossible to solve. And the second thing is that um, the quantities that really enter in these equations are virtually impossible to observe. So we have to do something else. The point is that there are just too many free parameters. There's all the space, there's all velocities, and we have to get rid of some of that information. The way we do that is um, it's called taking moments. So the equation that we're considering is the collisionless Boltzmann equation. It's called dftt is equal to zero. Now, if you have something that's equal to zero, then um, you can uh, you can do many things with that. For instance, you can uh, here under a you can integrate over all velocities. So if you have something that is zero, you integrate over all velocities. Well, then it's still zero. Um, you could also start by multiplying with velocity and then integrate over velocities, that's what we do on a B. So if you have something that's zero and you multiply by velocity and then you integrate over all velocities, you still get a zero. And you can do this many, many, many different ways. For instance, on the D, you say, okay, I multiply by velocity to power three and then I integrate over all velocities and I still have zero. So each one of these equation is actually a bit of a boring derivation to do. But if you do it, you end up having an equation that has much less free parameters. And the reason is that you have integrated over all velocities. Now, these, uh, this gives you an infinite set of equations, and they are called the Jeans equations. Um, Jeans was the first astronomer to use them. That's why he gets to have them named after him. Um, fortunately, we don't need to uh, to do this full uh, infinite set. You remember last time we talked about the hydrostatic equilibrium? It turned out that the, um, the first equation we derived was just a, a mass conservation, and the second equation we derived was, uh, was momentum conservation, and then we kind of stopped. And um, today we're going to be exactly that fortunate. So if you take the first one, this uh, you just take the collisionless Boltzmann equation and you just integrate it over all velocities. When you have done that, you look at the resulting equation and it is exactly mass conservation. That was kind of what we had hoped for and what we expected. The next one is much more complicated. You multiply by the velocity, you integrate over all velocities and well, you do uh, the math. And when you're done, you look at this equation and you realize this is actually conservation of momentum. And you remember that the hydrostatic equilibrium was exactly momentum conservation. So let's stick with this equation and, and let's rewrite it a little bit. When you rewrite it, you use a spherical system and uh, this uh, equation ends up looking like this. It says on the left hand side you have the total mass and on the right hand side you have something related to the velocity dispersion of the 
galaxies. You have the density. Well, inside this big square bracket, you have the logarithmic derivative of the density. You have the logarithmic derivative of the velocity dispersion. And then you have something uh, which is small, which we're not going to be too much concerned about in this course. Now, if we compare this equation that we just derived for collision-less structures, if we compare that to the uh, hypersteric equilibrium, they look extremely similar. So on the left-hand side, both equations have the total gravitating mass. So that is the mass of uh, galaxies, dark matter, gas, black hole, whatever. And on the right-hand side, they look very similar. They both have something that looks like a, like a temperature in front. For the uh, gas equation in the bottom, it's really the temperature of the gas. And uh, upstairs, on the Gene's equation, you have uh, something that is uh, the velocity dispersion of the galaxies. So that is how fast the galaxies are moving around. And you see those two terms, they look uh, exactly the same. And inside these square brackets, these two terms appear in exactly the same way, the logarithmic derivative of the temperature. And in addition, you have that, uh, that for the hydrostatic equilibrium, in the bottom you have the gas density, and in the gene integration in the top, you have the galaxy density. Uh, those are all things we can observe. Now, um, in front of all of this, there is a small constant in the hydrostatic equilibrium. And that's really just a question of, uh, of how you measure temperature, if you measure it, in, in which kind of units you measure it. And um, so that we can just ignore, it's just a, a normalization. And in the hydrostatic equilibrium, the last term is this 2 times beta. Uh, it's a very interesting term, but we are not going to discuss that in this course. That will be for later. So, where are we now? We are looking on the sky, we are looking at, uh, at the galaxies. These uh, galaxies are moving around, we treat them as point particles. Um, we can see where they are on the sky, and we can see how, uh, how fast they, uh, they move in the line of sight direction. And uh, now we have derived the uh, genes equation. And it says that um, on the left hand side it says you can get the, the total mass. You really want to know the total mass. It includes everything. The dark matter you cannot see and the gas and the, and the galaxies which you can't see. And how can you derive it? Well, you can derive it by looking at the right hand side. And um, Let's first throw away the 2 times beta. And then everything else is something you can observe directly on the sky. It is the velocity dispersion of uh, the galaxies, and it is the density of the galaxies. So with those few things measured, you can actually get the total mass. So in conclusion, if we can go on the sky, look at the galaxies, and we can measure the velocity dispersion and the density, um, then we have these, uh, these galaxies, these are tracers, and we measure these quantities. Then we can use the uh, genes equation to uh, derive the total mass. And of course now when we have the total mass, then we can get, for instance, the mass profile of the dark matter.